you very much, Matt. Yeah, after my uh, exit right on the last time, now I have the, the privilege of uh, finishing off the, being the ultimate conversation. So I'm either going to repeat things that have already been said or I'm going to put something different out there. Um, the good thing is I actually, despite there being very different um, industry participants in the room, I think there are lots of emergent themes and commonality. So we're either uh, in, in a group think mode or there's some convergence around thinking. So let me, I, I want to do a couple of things. One is just set the stage why we're here. I think uh, I'll go through that very quickly, but I'll put a, a, a tiny bit of a perspective of what it is that we're talking about with Internet of Things. Um, and then I, I want to talk about um, some business and technology implications, and that will be the second half of my presentation. Right, so it's traditional in IoT presentation to start off with a big slide, and there are several parameters people talk about. It's the number of devices, and the 2050, I've seen 200 and, and beyond billion now, the, the amount of data, um, at the amount of money that we're going to generate. And it turned out, you know, I was creating my own slides, and at the end of the day, I'm not an analyst, and I thought I'd better shut up and just leave it to people who know more about this than I do. But to me, um, why we care is because we're actually collect, uh, connecting a lot of our uh, existing and future infrastructure together, generating lots and lots of uh, uh, data. The data we're hoping to turn into some form of information, the information being protested into some sort of knowledge. Um, and hopefully with big data analysis, we're going to turn that knowledge into some insight. And I think there's another tier that was mentioned by Cisco, um, which is the foresight, sort of looking forward and, and, uh, and predictiveness. And why we care about that, I mean, it all comes down essentially to money. There's business value in, in doing that. And I, I see there really being two business drivers for why we care about this. The first is um, OPEX reduction, uh, doing more with what we have. And so one of the reasons why we see a lot of interest from traditionally non-IT savvy companies, the, the sort of... Uh, oil under your fingernails, oil and gas, energy, uh, com uh, companies like that. I think they're the first movers in this market, primarily because they have so much to gain by driving op operational efficiency with their uh, current infrastructure. So that, that's the first aspect. The second aspect is driving new business models. And this is where we see the opportunity to create whole new uh, engagement models with our customers, new revenue streams, thinking of being able to um, uh, not only lease uh, big pieces of equipment instead of selling them. So uh, traditional OEMs who, who create big spinning pieces of metal, for instance, are developing business models where they might, might lease that to um, a customer and sell them a predictive maintenance uh, package where, you know, so they, they guarantee uptimes and have an SLA that way. So it allows you to completely transform um, the way you do business. So that's why we care about it. Now let's just um, take, a, take a step back and look back to the early 1990s. I was very fortunate to have been working at CERN at the time. Uh, on the right is Tim Berners-Lee's next workstation. And, you know, fundamentally, I think what, uh, what Tim did is he did two things. He brought together the existing infrastructure, the ARPANET. That, at the time, was the, the internet as we knew it. It was primarily um, an academic-type network environment. I mean, the, the whole ARPANET is listed on all the nodes on the network on, on this slide. So it was a pretty uh, compact but uh, fairly global system. But um, Tim came up with a, a killer use case, which is the sharing of all uh, information. So he saw the world as a book, um, and then he, he came up with um, some use cases, but he did a lot more than that. He came up with some data models. He showed us what protocols we needed. He gave us some very nice tools. In fact, the very first web browser, Mac Web, was not only a, a reading device, but it was a full duplex. You were able to create content. It was actually what blogging and other microsites became much later. That was built into his original vision. Now, the key is that um, the infrastructure he built with uh, these tools, data models, and, um, and protocols have actually sustained a whole innovation cycle and well beyond sharing of information, so driving e-commerce and doing all sorts of uh, things that were never contemplated with it, social networking and other things, were possible because he architected the foundation of his use case in a very structured, very simplistic way, and it's, it's, it stood the, the testament of time. So, We've seen that from a technology perspective. Uh, if we look at the, imp the, the economic perspective, it's equally astounding. And um, you know, I don't have to preach to the choir here that um, the internet economy is real. It's a significant proportion of GDP for, uh, for mature countries, but also for emerging countries. So there's, n there's not only a technical aspect, but a, a life-changing economic aspect. And that's what we're hoping for with the Internet of Things. Now, I think Matt started off with a quote. Um, he embarrassed it a tiny bit what that I'm going to do. But um, you know, the point that, that uh, both Matt and I are trying to make here is that the Internet of Things is here today. 
is just here in a particular form, and we have to um, understand what, what it is and what it needs to evolve to. So I just want to take a couple of um, different use cases that I think of. So the, the Apple ecosystem, in my mind, is, um, is a sandbox, a wall garden uh, Internet of Things experience. So uh, iPhones, tablets, and other things that have accelerometers, different, uh, different sensors, GPS units, um, and they're connected uh, to the cloud as a developer. You don't have to care at all how that connectivity happens. You don't know whether it's been offloaded to Wi-Fi or on 3G. Um, Apple has provided a nice SDK and API um, for you to be able to program at the system level. So uh, things like storage, you don't really have to worry about locality of storage. So that's taken care of you by the API. Um, things like add in new functions with Siri, for instance, where you have some local processing, uh, hold to the back end some big data analytics, and then a, a reaction back to the front end. That's sort of closed loop systems that we're talking about with IoT. I mean, that all works today, and the consumer doesn't care about how it works. It just works like magic. Um, so that, that's here today. Somewhat less sexy um, is the, the communications infrastructure. I've just picked an example of a, a cable uh, modem company where, um, where you own the infrastructure end-to-end, -end, and the cable providers, for instance, in the US do that. They own the network. They own the box in your house. They provision that. They update it at night. Um, you know, as an example, my... Uh, my um, my broadband access has, has, has increased tenfold in, in bandwidth um, in the last few years without me doing anything at all. So all that you know, goodness and enrichment of the infrastructure is being managed by the cable providers. Now, that, that's fairly basic, but one thing I've noticed is my cable provider on a monthly basis tries to sell me new services. They're trying to monitor my home alarm system. They're trying to set, sell me some e-health systems. They're trying to do all sorts of other uh, incremental revenue applications with something that is, you know, moving bits through a pipe. So, you know, this, this is fairly transformational to current businesses. The point I want to make here again is that if you own the infrastructure end to end and have a wall garden, the Internet of Things exists today. So vertically integrated use cases um, are all around us. What we're really talking about there is creating a generic architecture, and we're, we sort of... Um, have been uh, sort of focusing on a three-tier model. We're not, at, we're not saying this is literally the system topology that everything will adhere to in the Internet of Things, but we want to take a system-level view, and I think it's important whether you're a cloud provider, realizing what goes on south of the cloud and in the fog of the device, or if you're an embedded systems provider like WinRiver, um, understanding that uh, you, the device that you're provisioning is going to be part of a much broader system. So one big shift that we all need to be aware of is stepping outside of our domain and looking at the, the system end-to-end. -end. Now, we, we use this diagram not from a technology perspective, but also to think about the business implications. There are literally billions of, of devices out there that uh, are getting more and more connected. There's a, an install base, a legacy infrastructure that's not going to be ripped out. In the energy sector, um, life cycles of devices are you know, in the 10 to 15 years. We see in aerospace and defense is decades. We have service contracts for avionics companies, for instance, that are in the decades. That infrastructure is not going away. So the, we see uh, an opportunity to address what we call the brownfield infrastructure, and that's the, a very near-term opportunity we have to address, which is uh, enabling the goodness of Internet of Things for things that are already out there in the environment around us. And a gateway type architecture is a good way of doing that because it allows you to connect um, you know, a multitude of existing centers so you can do some protocol translation, things like that. You can do some local compute and then have your gateway be the more modern, if you like, cloud connector that goes back to your back end. Similarly, I think we see a shift from a business perspective. Anything below uh, the cloud is typically in a cost reductive zone. So this is where the OPEX play comes, comes into things, where you really want to maximize the, the usage of infrastructure. The business models tend to be very, very price sensitive. There's a huge amount of fragmentation, um, as we saw with the Libellium uh, presentation, where the use case is so diverse, you're going to see fragmentation of use cases and business models below the line. Um, above the line in, in the data center and the cloud, that's where we see a lot more convergence, standardization, and some big players um, aggregating the value. Um, the services that you're offering from the cloud level tend to be revenue generative. So being able to um, you know, create new applications, uh, do, do more stuff with data, that's um, generally in the, in the cleaner environment up in the cloud. So I mentioned this just as a, ref, a frame of reference for, for what we're doing, because there's some implications in accepting this as really you know, what, what's happened when you're moving beyond your domain of a, a single box or a single data center into looking at the whole thing, and I'll get to that in a second. 
So, you know, the things that keep me up at night are not technology focused. I actually think that um, all the technology we need is almost here today. Most, most of it is here today. There are things that we could evolve for sure. Uh, standards, you know, throughput, low, low latency, deterministic Ethernet, things like that. They're going to continue to involve, evolve. But um, we, we, can, we can build an internet of things today. Um, one of the key things that, is, that we have to overcome is how we manage the value chain. So when you start thinking about it as a system of systems, uh, you have to question who your real customer is. Who, who are you really selling um, an offer to? For instance, if you're selling a cloud service that you may need to deploy over someone's infrastructure, how do you do that? And how, how, as a consumer, do you have someone on the hook for the SLA? You know, who do you call when things go wrong? That supply chain is very, very complex. And I think the fact that um, in this room today we've seen you know, uh, mobile operators like IBM and Oracle and people who don't regularly meet in a forum like this, certainly not with you know, industrial control companies and things like that, shows that you know, we have to think about the ecosystem as being cross-domain um, and very, very complex. And uh, the business model issues um, are really quite hard. So that, that's the number one thing that I personally worry about as a barrier to adoption for Internet of Things. The other thing, um, so referring back to you know, the system topology, is there's what I call a, a collision of domains. So um, the enterprise is used to designing uh, you know, very scalable systems from an IT perspective. Um, and they, they do that with certain protocols and certain processes. Um, and they're not at all familiar with concepts like um, certifications, six nines availability, um, uh, trusted systems, and, and uh, uh, medical certification, for instance, for, for devices. And so, you know, these worlds have to get to know each other a little bit. And similarly, if you flip, um, flip that argument on its head, people who, who develop devices have to become more IT-centric. So no longer are we talking about uh, deploying fixed function devices that you can ship into the field and they do their thing for, for a while. We have to think of devices as being uh, field upgradable, field changeable, and that changes the whole uh, development paradigm um, for this to become a reality. Um, now, in, in reality, so we're, I'm just simplistically showing two domains. There are actually multiple domains. At the, the very, very bottom, there's a control system domain, which is you know, critical. You, you rarely want to touch that stuff. That's the stuff that uh, is landing your aircraft or you know, controlling your production line. And you want to do the minimal changes there as possible. And so you have to separate that, that environment from an open application environment that is enabled through your operational uh, system, your OT environment. So I, I really think that you know, if we would decompose this properly, we'd be talking about a three-tier uh, domain expertise, IT, OT, and control. Um, and we see that very much in, in industrial and, uh, uh, and, in, and energy systems. So that's one thing to think about. Another aspect is to think about um, managing not only consumer-like devices, which are by and large unregulated. There are some, you know, some uh, regulation around uh, safety and so on. But in, in very regulated environments, and say like energy, like industri industrial control, like medicine, like aviation, um, you have to adhere to some very, very strict standards. And being able to uh, figure out that regulation top to bottom so that, for instance, um, your energy data may not actually be able to uh, go off premise into uh, a public cloud. You may need a, um, a resident local uh, cloud, a private cloud, and something on premise that you can uh, through rec you show the regulators that you're managing the data, that you have the records that it's needed. That sort of thing happens in the financial industry and everywhere else. So that causes a lot of complication in the way that we think about uh, developing a very scalable uh, IoT architecture. Um, we're focused on, we, we've, we've done some, uh, some studies and talked to our customers, and there are five broad use cases that, uh, that we're looking to address. Um, the top two that we're uh, focused on implementing now are uh, adaptive analytics, where you're gaining insight, you're sucking as much data as you can from your overall infrastructure, doing some back-end data processing, and then taking some actuation um, sometime later. Uh, the second uh, use case that we're focused on is, is taking the step further, which is to actuate back to the edge, so having a full closed-loop control system in predictive maintenance where you avoid truck rolls, reduce your operational expenses, and, um, and actually deliver new services to customers who are leasing your equipment. So, you know, quite often when, um, when I hear people talk about big data, um, the next few sentences are generally things like Hadoop, HDFS, um, MapReduce, all sorts of 
you know, jargon that the likes of uh, Facebook and Google um, use. But actually, the, the importance of big data in IoT is that closed loop act actuation. If, we're, if you just sense in data and, and aggregate it in the cloud and then doing some intelligent uh, action with it later, you've really just got a, a device monitoring system, and that's been around for a while. Um, so, you know, some of the issues that we need to address, and I think IBM uh, articulated this very well, is that um, you need some more deterministic type closed loop uh, feedback system. So you can't afford necessarily to aggregate all the data that you want, both for economic and technical reasons. You can't always aggregate the data you want. You can't aggregate a big enough data set for, sign for statistical significance. And so we've got to think about big data as being more of a distributed compute model rather than something that happens on the back end. Let me run through uh, this example because I'm almost out of time. The point I was going to make here is around um, your data architecture. So uh, there's a tendency with big data to, to say, well, just give me the data and I'll figure out what to do with it later. But if you want to do some, um, some uh, create some new use cases like uh, collision avoidance systems, you actually need to architect the data and the connection between the data at multiple levels in your architecture. And so you need a system architect who's going to architect um, data top to bottom, and again, that's an issue because this typically falls across different supply chain boundaries. A device manufacturer may not be the person implementing uh, a, a traffic avoidance system somewhere later, and so that sort of complexity um, becomes really compounded in this environment. Um, I've mentioned the notion of uh, intelligence where you need it, where you're, uh, you're extracting data from a sensor at the edge, doing something um, uh, in your data center, predict, uh, doing some, getting some sort of insight or action, but then closing the loop to the edge. You, you actually need a multi-tier level of computational power, which actually forces the, um, the edge sensors, which we talk about as being very dumb, to actually be more intelligent than you think if you want to do um, some, some local control systems. Now, a lot of uh, applications do require uh, significant intelligence at the gateway, where we can do uh, local event processing, uh, data throttling, things like that, um, but also more and more at the edge. Now, the other thing that's happening at the edge is uh, device consolidation and virtualization. As an example, in the automotive industry, uh, a modern vehicle has um, you know, 80 to 100 plus ECUs in the car for different uh, systems. Well, that has uh, uh, power weight um, issues, and so you know, if you can take the three miles of cabling out of the car, you can get a few pence per mile energy savings. And the way that you can actually achieve that is when you virtualize um, each of these ECUs, consolidate them on a, a, a bigger uh, piece of silicon, um, and then um, have a, an integrated partition environment. And that's exactly the architecture that uh, we've been driving in avionics for a while. So um, you know, there's a good proof point. You're, you're flying that sort, of, uh, that sort of system every time you get on the plane. I'm not going to go into security due to lack of time, but from a, this is a very embedded perspective, and um, it, it may not entirely resonate. Certainly, the cloud should resonate. I think the cloud has been a force and function for thinking about systems in a very, very different way. The notion of seemingly infinite compute or compute in demand has become a reality. Uh, it's very easy. We have uh, instances running on uh, AWS. Um, you know, just swipe your credit card, and you can deploy a very, very scalable uh, compute environment. But if you look at it from the bottom up, there's actually been a seminal shift in the industry where uh, for the longest time with Moore's law, we've been chasing high and high, higher clock frequencies and you've got additional uh, performance on your device um, almost for free. You just uh, follow the technology life cycle. Well, the, um, the silicon process actually hit a wall with that just due to physics. And the way that um, the semiconductor industry has addressed that is um, uh, they came up with multi-core architectures which are much more power efficient but introduced a huge amount of complexity from a software perspective. So imagine having to take a single threaded monolithic application and then partition it on a multi-core environment. As soon as you start doing that, you start uh, asking yourself whether that's the right system architecture for you. And very quickly through virtualization, uh, customers ask themselves, well, if I'm going to have to separate out my system and virtualize it, do I really need to run it at the edge? Or am I going to run it in my data center? And uh, those of you who've been following GE and their industrial ethernet, that's the internet, that's exactly what they're talking about doing is, is uh, disaggregating the edge and the, uh, and the data center. So I, I believe these three things are, are very um, technical but also business uh, proof points of why things are changing today. 
So with that, I'm, I'm going to wrap. I'm not going to tell you about the, the products that, the, that we built, but I'd be happy to talk to you offline. So I think we could, uh, we could close with that now.